Second thing, we have opportunity today to bring in some, some new members. And uh, we have some folks that have gone through our membership class and then uh, met with the deacons last week and would like to become members here at Cedar Hill Baptist Church. And so uh, if you would uh, come up at this time, um, Pete and Kim Netznick and Karen Andrews, if you meet me right here, I'll come down here. <clears throat> Always good to have folks that um, uh, want to be part of the church. They want to be part of the uh, uh, ministry here. Uh, they've uh, went through our membership class um, uh, so all three weeks of uh, listening to me talk about the church and what we believe and why we believe it. Then they met with the deacons last week right up here and uh, gave their testimonies of uh, how they accepted Christ and then um, were baptized and so forth. And so uh, it's a joy to have these folks that want to be part of our church and want to join in and uh, obviously already being faithful members, uh, faithful attendees of our church. We appreciate that uh, very much. I'm going to have a word of prayer with them this morning. Uh, before I do that, listen, I, I always say I think membership is a two-way thing. Uh, it gives uh, an opportunity for them to join the church and to help in the ministry here. God using their time or talents or however God lays on their heart to help pull the weight of the ministry. Likewise, it's the church's responsibility to be there for them in time of need, in time of a problem or pain or sorrow or joy uh, to be there with them and to encourage them and to help them uh, through those times as well. And so I'm going to have a word of prayer uh, with them this morning. And then um, how about I have maybe uh, Joel Fitz. Yeah, I see him sitting on this aisle. He's going to come up and uh, shake your hand. And uh, I know Lucy's up here with us as well. The next next daughter is up here as well. And uh, by the way, Karen is Kim's mom. So there's a relation here as well. These are a family here, and so it's good to have the whole family join here this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for these dear folks. Thank you for the Netsnicks. Thank you for uh, um, Karen as well and the opportunity we have to join uh, in fellowship with them. Lord, they, they, they are committed enough at Cedar Hill Baptist Church that they want their name on the roll. They want to be part of the membership here. And Lord, that's encouraging to us. Lord, it gives us an opportunity to know that they agree with this church, agree with the, the doctrinal position and, and what we're doing as a ministry moving forward uh, uh, with, our, with our goals and, and with what uh, you've laid on our hearts. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, may we as a church body uh, be able to come alongside them to help them and encourage them, make them feel very much part of the family here at Cedar Hill. Lord, we thank you for their testimonies. Lord, each of, each of them last week were uh, more than willing and able to give of a testimony that this is what we believe and this is when we accepted Christ and this is when we were baptized. And Lord, we thank you that they gave a public testimony there of the decision that they made to follow Jesus Christ. Lord, that's most important, and we thank you for that. Lord, we ask now that um, uh, this uh, uh, friendship and this union of church member here, Lord, may we continue together until you come back or until you call us home. And Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. All right. Brother Joel, one of our deacons, is going to shake your hand this morning. Then you can have a, have a seat and take a seat. Thank you so much. If you're happy that they joined, would you say amen? Amen. amen. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. John 17, John 17, as an introduction, I, uh, we completed our, my uh, preaching through the book of Hebrews, I started preaching through the book of Hebrews beginning of the year, and we did that. I'm continuing with our theme throughout the year of standing firm. We have that on our banners. And so I try the first Sunday of every month to focus our, uh, our sermon title, sermon emphasis on that very theme. But I wanted to start at least a little mini-series here for a couple weeks, all from John chapter 17. If you remember, just a few years ago, uh, I preached a sermon of... Um, uh, the, the last words of Jesus, the last lessons that he gave. And between John 13 and John 18, we have the, the picture there of everything happening from the upper room, um, Jesus praying in the garden, 
uh, all the way through his arrest in John chapter 18. Uh, None of the other Gospels highlight that conversation as much. In fact, if you just look at the numbers of the chapters, uh, you see that the the very last hours of Jesus' life on earth is is a good part of the book of John. Those things begin really in the middle of the book of John. While the other Gospels uh, spend a lot of time on the parables and the teachings in the the first, you know, I'm sorry, the the three and a half years of Christ's ministry, John focuses his uh, bulk of his book on those last hours of Jesus' life upon this earth uh, before he died on Calvary and then, of course, rose again. This is kind of the end of that. John 17 is the very end of that. Uh, In fact, John 17 begins with, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. And so we have here in John 17 um, a prayer, Jesus' prayer. Uh, um, uh, My Bible at the very top calls it a farewell prayer. And the last recorded prayer we have, except for those things that he uttered on the cross Uh, of Calvary as he is crucified, but his last uh, prayer here before his crucifixion, and we have those things that he covered, and there's a a theme throughout this chapter that I want to unpack in the time that we have here over the next couple weeks. I think it's very important for us, and so um, we'll look at John 17, not just today, but in the next couple of weeks as well. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the reading of the text. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask now your blessing on the time that we have here Uh, in the word today. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather as we have, Lord, all the things that have led up to this part. Lord, this is an opportunity we have now as a church family to open the word of God together uh, for the pastor, the under-shepherd, to take the word of God and proclaim it, and for the Holy Spirit then to take those words from your precious word and, and apply them to our heart. And so, Lord, I pray this morning uh, that you give me the the words to say and the strength to uh, to speak that which you've laid on my heart. We thank you. We ask this in your name. Amen. John 17, starting in verse number one. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, Before the world was, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou thou gavest me, and they have kept thy word. I'm going to stop right there. There's a a pattern in this chapter, and I, I this is not something I normally do, though based upon our study of how to study the Bible, beginning tonight, uh, we may do this more often. But if you underline or circle things or highlight things in your Bible, I'm going to give you some things in this chapter to highlight and and to underline and to mark. I did this years ago in my Bible, and uh, uh, it's been very helpful because when I open John 17, these four little phrases jump off the page, and I, I can find it very easily that way too, and I'm trying to remember what chapter, and I begin to turn. So we're going to highlight a couple of things, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it with you, because I study out of a Thompson Chain study Bible. It sits right beside my bed. I was using it last night as I was further preparing this message. But when I get up to preach on Sunday morning, I take this giant print Bible, because I can see it better, and I don't stumble over the words as I'm trying to read. I haven't highlighted it in this Bible. It's in my study Bible. It's in the one I use for sermon preparation. So I'm going to do it with you this morning if you want to. The first one was in verse number six. And it's, it's this phrase, out, out of the world. Out of the world. So, so he said in verse six, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. All right, let's continue reading. Verse seven. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. 
For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I am come out from thee. And they did, I'm sorry, they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. The second one is in verse number 11 right there. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I, I underline that. I underline that in my Bible. In the world. So we have verse number 6, out of the world. Verse 11, in the world. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, there it is again, but we don't need to underline it again. I kept them in thy name, and those thou gavest me I have kept. None of them is lost, but the son of perdition. That's Judas Iscariot, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I am come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them thy word. The world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And so I underlined, not of the world, right there in verse number 14. That's the third one. We're gonna, I'm going to preach these as four separate messages here moving forward. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So there it is again, but again, we, we're, we already highlighted that. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also sent them into the world. And there's the last one in verse number 18. Sent them into the world. So we have out of the world, in the world, not of the world, but sent into the world. We have four different uh, movements there of the people that Christ is praying for. We're going to stop right there. Um, here in John 17, we see Jesus lifting up his eyes and he's praying. In chapter 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where there was a garden into the which he entered his disciples, and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. And so in chapter 18, verses 1, 2, and 3, and so forth, he's arrested. So that's the end of the prayer. Chapter 17 is the entirety of this prayer that Jesus prays. And so the first thing I want to highlight, Jesus Christ is about to be crucified. He's about to face horrific physical torture and death. This is the end of his physical life on earth. Obviously, after his resurrection, he he spends 40 days back upon the earth, but he's in a resurrected body. And so now this is the end of his uh, 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 humility, if you will, here upon this earth. He's about to be crucified. And so in the midst of that prayer, he starts by saying, I have completed the work. But then he spends almost the entirety of this chapter, almost the entirety of the prayer, Praying for people. Praying for his followers. Praying for those that are to come after the generations. That would, that would include you and me. He's praying for those that would come in the days ahead. For those that were left behind, for his disciples, his apostles, his followers, those that believed. He spends his time praying for them. Jesus, in his last moments, before his crucifixion, spends the majority of his time Praying for other people. Praying for them. That's the focus of this. And so he, he differentiates these four things that we highlighted there down through verse number 18. He has those that he saved, um, uh, that God gave him, verse number 6, that thou gavest me out of the world. We're going to highlight that today. So these are people that are saved out of the world, listen, but are left in the world. He wants them not to be of the world. And in fact, 
not only are they still in the world, but he's turned around and sent them to the world. That, I, I, that's, our, that's our picture of who we are, of the way we are to live. God saved us. Praise God, he saved us out of the world. And we know this. This is a simple understanding of how God's organization works. But the moment we were saved, we weren't escorted straight to heaven, were we? Now we get saved and yet we remain. God's left us here. He's left us here for a purpose. And so we're saved out of the world. The Bible says, I was of my father, the devil. But that all changed. So I'm saved out of the world. I'm left in the world. And even though I'm left in the world, I'm not supposed to be of the world. That's the separation that we're going to talk about in a couple weeks. So we're not supposed to be like the world. There's supposed to be a difference. And then, not only am I uh, saved out of it and left in it and separated from it, I am in turn supposed to be sent back to it. I think there's a big difference. I don't know about you, but to me, the, the second and fourth sounded on the surface somewhat the same. I'm in it, but I'm sent back to it. Well, yeah, I, I'm still in it, but I'm not supposed to be in the world just lingering, just holding, just maintaining. I'm in the world to make a difference in the world. I'm in the world to reach those who are still of the world and need to be saved out of the world. God's given me a job in the world because he sent me back to the world. If you will, picture that. You know, I was, I was, I was looking at different illustrations, trying to put together an, an illustration. Let's say, let's say Dillsburg was a rough community. Right? It's not, so that's why I'm picking on it. You know, I'm not picking on a rough community by name. Let's say Dillsburg was a tough place to grow up, tough place to live. You know, people's lives just, it was a place people wanted to get out of. Maybe it is, but I don't think so. I think Dillsburg's a nice community. Let's say Dillsburg was a tough community and, and somehow um, things happened. Maybe you got that scholarship or you got that, that opportunity and you got out of Dillsburg, right? Got out of it. But in the course of, of time, as things worked out, you kept your residency in it. But you weren't really a part of it any, anymore. You were, you were on your way to making your life different outside of Dillsburg. But you decided with all that good fortune that came your way, you're going to return all that back towards making Dillsburg a better place. We see that with maybe athletes sometimes, some of them, right? They get saved out of maybe the tough neighborhood or the projects. Mom still lives there. Brothers and sisters still live there. They remain connected to it, and they try to take some of what they have earned and, and help make a difference there. So on a much larger scale than that, and a much more eternal level than that, and a much more important level than that, you and I are saved out of this world, and yet we're still here. We're here for a time. Not to become like the world again, but to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That's the pattern. That, that's the goal that we're working on here. So today, I want to talk about being saved out of the world. I wrote down, I wrote down some things uh, here real quick. And the first one is just neat the way the Lord worked. I, I wrote my sermon earlier in the week, and then I refined it last night. And uh, early, like right after dinner last night, I took my books upstairs and began to work on my message and my Sunday school lesson because I taught Sunday school today. And um, I, I wrote down when I, when, I, when I made my first point, I wrote, my identity changed, I have a new name. That's the first thing I wrote, I have a new name. 8.30 last night, I download an email from Kelly with the songs we're singing today and put on the PowerPoint slides. I do the slides. She picks the songs. She writes the slides. I just download them. <laughs> Mine's easy. The first song that we're going to sing today is a new name written down. And I'm like, well, I was just thinking that song, you know. 
Uh, listen, our, our name changed. The Bible says we were of our father, the devil. Uh, the Bible says I have a new family now. I'm adopted. I'm a child of the king. When he saved me out of the world, he changed my identity. He changed my name. He changed my family. I'm, I'm no longer of the family I used to be. I'm now of God's family. I'm joint heirs with Jesus Christ. When he saved me, he changed my entire identity of who I am. Most of you know, if I've told a little bit of this through the years, but my father, my father was adopted. My father was uh, uh, adopted by the Gunther family. Uh, he was, I think, three years old, three, three and a half, almost four years old. And uh, his, uh, his biological father died. Uh, his mother left with three or four kids. She was not a, um, she was not a good mom. And uh, she gave some of the kids to relatives and um, uh, had my dad adopted out. Um, and then she went to San Francisco and opened a bar. So uh, that was the grandma I never knew. You know. um, Dad got adopted by the Gunther family. And uh, you know, for, there was a time early in his life, listen, early in his life when he was you know, old enough to understand all this, he questioned, why was he the only one adopted out? You know, relatives took his older siblings and his younger siblings, but they adopted him. Maybe he was that bad. You know? <laughs> he would say that. I'm not picking on him. He would say that. But that wasn't it. I, I think God had a plan. God had a plan to move him out of that family. That, that was a rough and tumble group. They, were, they all lived in western Pennsylvania. Uh, I can tell you, it's, it's the Yauger family, Y-A-U-G-E-R. I could have been Pastor Yauger. I'll go with Gunther. Much better, you know, but Yauger. They were the Yauger family, and they're rough and tumble. I Googled them a few times. I did Ancestry.com and Googled them. Yeah, there's a lot of police reports out there. <laughs> Yauger Hollow is a rough place, you know, and it's called Yauger Hollow, and they're rough and tumble. Dad was adopted out of that and, 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 and put with the Gunther family, and, um, it wasn't long after that dad's adopted father, Grandpa Gunther, he passed away. And so my dad uh, had lost both of his dads before he was 10 years old. But he was raised by his mom. His mom was a godly woman, a godly woman who took him to church and, and, and wanted to make sure he understood. And I don't know, right, what would have happened if he'd have remained with his biological family out there in Western PA, but he was raised by a godly lady in Baltimore, Maryland. He, he had a new family. He had a, a new name. He had a whole new identity. Everything changed. He no longer had any ties to that group out there. He didn't know him. Wouldn't know him to run into him. But he had a new mom and a new dad and a new home and a new place. The Bible says we are adopted. We are, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and we are considered to be joint heirs with him, as if we're a brother in the family. We have a seat at the table. We have his name. We inherit what he inherits. We're with God for eternity. Everything changed. I'm saved out of the world. I have a new home. John 14 tells us, I go to prepare a place for you that... Where I go, you may be also. What a wonderful promise that is. That there's a home being prepared, a place being prepared, a, a table being prepared for me. My identity changed when I was saved out of this world. Number two, my, my purpose changed. My purpose changed. In other words, I now I have a purpose for living, and I, that's... That's the one thing uh, we talk a lot about in our, in our culture today. We, we have people, uh, talking to someone just before the service today, about, about uh, people who commit suicide and take their lives. And at my Sunday school lesson this morning was on Judas Iscariot, and obviously Judas, overcome by guilt, took his own life. That's how his tragic story ended in a horrible manner. But that's reality of 
too many people, too many people in the world around us, too many people in our country, too many people in the communities, and maybe people that we know real well, they, they have no purpose. They're looking for a purpose, and I think we see that more than ever today, that people want a purpose. They want to have a purpose that drives them, and it, it may be uh, something you and I disagree with, right? They, they, all kinds of different things that people come up with. Uh, I understand you talk to um, uh, college kids today, many of them getting in journalism. Why are you in journalism? Well, I want to, I want to change the world which wasn't really the purpose of journalism. But anyway, well, that's a different, different lesson for a different day. But I, they want to make a difference. They want to have a purpose. Uh, people get behind you know, climate change because they, they feel like they have a purpose to get behind. Uh, people get behind, you know, um, uh, I, we're not going to talk about the skunks this morning. If you've been around, you know what I mean. But, uh, you know, my, my son in wildlife management, right, they feel like they have a purpose in, in taking care of these animals that otherwise would, would be killed or wouldn't survive or wouldn't make it. They pour themselves into animals. That people have a purpose. Their purpose maybe becomes their family, becomes their children, becomes their job or their career of some sort, it becomes a passion, becomes a hobby, or their hobby becomes a purpose. People are looking for that. Well, when, the moment we accept Christ as Savior, our purpose is clearly defined. We understand what our purpose is. Our purpose is to glorify Him. That's our purpose. It's supposed to be the purpose of all creation and of all mankind. But without Christ and blinded by the, by the world and blinded by sin, people aren't going to determine that for themselves. But once we understand who we are in Christ... It defines our purpose. What, why am I alive? What am I here for? Well, that makes it very clear. I'm supposed to glorify him. I'm supposed to help point others to him. I'm supposed to grow in my knowledge and understanding of him. I'm supposed to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And all of those things together glorify him. It's all about him. Jesus said that at the beginning of John chapter 17. Remember, the Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. There was a purpose to all of that. Jesus Christ made um, a, a creation. We know Christ was uh, involved at the very beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made. That was made, John chapter 1. So Christ, at the very beginning of creation, made all of creation to glorify God. That's the purpose of mankind. That's the purpose of all creation. Christ talked about it in John 17. His last prayer on earth, before he goes to the cross, he says, Lord, may I be glorified when I'm on the cross that you may be glorified through all that I'm doing. It is our ultimate duty. And so our purpose changes. I'm saved out of the world. I'm still living in the world. What does it mean to be saved out of the world? Well, my identity changed. I have a new destination, a new name. I have a new purpose. What I'm supposed to be doing, why I'm here, has changed. Of course, my destination has changed. We've talked about that and our home being prepared. Number four, I wrote down, the bondage of sin has changed. The bondage of sin has changed. No longer am I bound to that. No longer am I enslaved to that. Paul talks about that so much in the book of Romans. We are free now from the chains of sin. Grace has given us the power to have victory over sin. In fact, I am dead to sin. That was the picture, that is the picture of baptism, right? Buried with Christ, dying to self and dying to the old man and dying to sin, raised again in newness of life. I'm free from that sin. Sin still has a, a hold on us sometimes, doesn't it? There's that temptation. There's that sin that doth so easily beset us. But the bottom line is, according to the promise of the word of God, I have victory over it. 
I may not claim it. I may not access it. But I can be victorious over it because of the grace that God has given us. So that bondage of sin has changed. Number five, I wrote down, my character should change. Should. It's supposed to. I'm supposed to be made in the image of Jesus Christ. So I'm saved out of the world, so the way that I, I act, the way that I think, all of those things should change in my life. My character has to change. My response to people, my language, my thought life. Because of Christ saving me out of the world, I'm no longer a slave to the world. I'm no longer of my father, the devil. Therefore, I should be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. On Wednesdays, we've been looking at 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. It's a whole list there. In fact, let's, let's turn there real quick. Let's turn there real quick. 2 Peter chapter 1. This is not the only list like this in the Bible, but we're, we're studying this one as our Wednesday night Bible study. Verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. You know what, I'm going to start in verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That's something else we have because we've been saved out of the world. I can claim these promises. That these, by, by these, by these, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Again, saved out of that world. So, here's the list, verse 5. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So because I'm saved out of the world, and it talks about that in verse number four, doesn't it? Having escaped the corruption that's in the world. We've been saved out of the world. Jesus Christ, as he's praying there in the garden, just before he goes to the cross of Calvary, he's praying for people. He's praying for his followers, his disciples, the believers that have surrounded him in his ministry. He's praying for those to come. That would be you and I. And in the midst of that, as he's praying for them, he says, I've, they've been saved out of the world left in the world and sent to the world, but saved out of the world. So this passage correlates with that. Here's Peter, one of those very apostles that was present in all of this and involved in all of this. We looked at him in some detail in Sunday school this morning. Jesus said, I, they've been saved out of the world. Peter then writes to the church, we've escaped the corruption that's in the world. Peter said, we've been saved out of the world, left in the world, but saved out of it. How, how are you saved out of it? Well, our, our identity changed and our purpose changed and our destination changed. The bondage of sin has changed and now, now we have a list here. My character is supposed to change. Some of those things were, were automatic, right? The moment I accepted Christ, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's not, will never be blotted out. It's sealed by the Holy Spirit. I, I didn't have to do anything for that, right? I accepted Christ. He did all the work. Jesus paid it all. It's all done. I have a new family. I have a new name. I have a new destination. I will spend eternity with him forever. Those things are secure. God's given me a new purpose. I may not embrace it or I may not have claimed it, but he's given me a new purpose. But my character, my character is something I'm supposed to work on. Right? I, I say that Listen, because it tells us in this passage, you're supposed to add to your faith virtue, and then so forth, and then so forth, and then so add. These are things we're supposed to work on. These are supposed to, things that we're supposed to address in our lives and change our character into the character of Jesus Christ. My character 
is supposed to change. Why? I've been saved out of this world. I've been saved from the world's influence. I've been saved out of the the dominion of the world and the impact of the world in my life. Now it's supposed to change. My character should change as well. And then the last one I wrote down, number six, my priorities should change. If my purpose changed, and it did, then my priorities should change. The things that used to matter don't matter anymore. The focus of what I'm supposed to be attentive to should change. The things that are of utmost importance should change. Living for Christ, pleasing to him, what's the will of God for me in my life? Those things should become a priority. I think we would agree before we knew Christ, when we were in the world, of the world, part of the world, and not out of the world, we didn't care about that. We didn't care about what the will of God was in my life. We didn't care about pleasing him. We had our own ambitions and our own goals and our own things that we wanted. But now that I've been saved out of the world, my priorities need to change. The things that become important should change in my life. What am I doing that's pleasing to him? Am, am Am I the spouse that I'm supposed to be in the image of Christ? Am I the parent I'm supposed to be? Am I the employee or employer that I'm supposed to be to glorify Christ? Is it about, um, you know, uh, getting ahead and making the most money? Or is it about doing that which is pleasing to him and a godly heritage? Our priorities start to change from what they were to what they should be. So John 17, I want to look at it over the next couple of weeks because John 17, we're saved out of the world. I wanted to highlight that today. But in the midst of all that, and you know, we've already looked at it, we may be saved out of the world, but guess what? We're still here. All those things that I mentioned have changed. My identity, my name, all those things have changed, but I'm still living in this world. And we're going to sing, we will sing, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through, but I'm here today, right? I'm here today. So what is God's expectation of me living in the world today? Then we're going to look, I may be in the world, but I'm not supposed to be of the world. There's a change. That's going to be, I think that's one of the harder parts in this list, right? We may be in the world, and the world has a big influence. The world is, uh, the world There's a lot. There's a lot going on, a lot of culture being thrown our way. So it's hard not to be of the world. And then not only that, we're sent back into the world. We're going to talk a little bit about the Great Commission. We have a duty to make sure others know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had today. Thank you for the privilege of being able to look at this chapter. Lord, I think it's one of the... um, just uh, layers and depths of information and important things for us to see here in John 17. These very last words spoken in prayer in your time upon this earth. Lord, may we learn from that. May we see the emphasis. Your emphasis were, was others. It was people, not yourself. It was people. And then, Lord, may we see your, what your plan was, what your prayer was, for the people that remain. Lord, we thank you for this time we've had. Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you as Savior, perhaps they're here today and they can say, Pastor Wes, I'm not sure I'm saved out of the world. I'm not sure I'm I'm an adopted child of Christ. I'm not sure I've ever come to a, a place where I've made a decision for Jesus Christ. If that's your concern, if that's if you're being honest enough with that, then make today your day of salvation. I don't want you to leave here today without making sure of that. As we break after the service today, I'll be at the back door. If you don't know Christ as Savior, on your way out, would you say, Pastor Wes, pray for me. I'd like to talk to you sometime. Pray for me. It would be our honor, my privilege, to be able to introduce you to Jesus Christ. 
Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had. Lord, may it make a difference in our lives. May we see our place in all of this. How you've transitioned us out of the world, in the world, not of the world, sent to the world. Lord, may we see where we are in that dynamic. Lord, we thank you. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Our last song, Just Over in the Glory Land, 838. Let's stand together as we sing our final song.